uh, some folks joining us. We, uh, we want to welcome all of you both here in person at Our Savior's Lutheran Church, as well as those of you who are joining us online this morning. A special welcome to the folks at Shepherd of the Valley in Maple Valley. Pastor Andy Arnold is there uh, hosting a group, and we're glad to have them joining us as well. I want to uh, start with an acknowledgement. We acknowledge the original inhabitants of this area, the Coast Salish people. Since time immemorial, they have hunted, fished, gathered, and taken care of these lands. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and honor their sacred spiritual connection with the land and the water. We will strive to be honest about our past mistakes and bring about a future that includes their people, stories, and voices to form a more just and equitable society. With that, I'm going to uh, introduce Pastor Terry Kylo, who will introduce our guests for this morning. And then uh, one of our guests will begin our session with a native blessing. Terry, welcome. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. And thank you to all the people of, um, of our saviors. And I also just want to give a quick shout out to Andy, who I got to spend some time with this last week. So it's good to see you again. And Daryl Shane as well. Uh, to see you. So I want to introduce to you very briefly so that they have the time uh, to, to speak with you and ask her any questions. Um, Jay and Kay Knott, will you, Jay, Kay Knott, will you please come up forward? This is, this is going to be Kay Knott. She is a, uh, a member of the Upper Skagit tribe. She is an elder of that tribe. I've got to know Kay over the last seven to eight months, and she is very dear to me. And so I want you all to please welcome Kay. And then I would I would also like to introduce to you today Jay Bowen. Jay is also uh, these these two are sister and brother, by the way. And Jay is a is a member of the Upper Skagit tribe, and he is an elder of that tribe. He's also an incredible artist. So just look him up on Google, and you'll find his work. Um, these two people are very dear to me, and it's my honor to introduce you to them. So please give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Terry, Dahadubs, Pastor Rick, Gulaku uh, Hasayaya, Gulaku Deishin. We'd like to uh, thank you for inviting us here today. Uh, we are your neighbors to your north at Upper Skagit. Uh, we are the people of the river. Anybody know Skagit people? No. Have you been from Mount Vernon up to New Haven? Okay, so you're <laughs> at 1.5 million acres there, you'll find a Skagit land and I'll be talking about that. But I'd like to open with a blessing that was given to us from one of our elders by Hilbert. And I find that these words uh, work everywhere. And they work especially when you're building relationships with different people, different backgrounds and different cultures. So uh, I have been given permission to share these words and I hope you appreciate them as much as I do. Gulapu siyab diishin. Tigui tabuthit chad. Tigui tabuthit chad. Daiha tia suskok cha altia slaheo. Askok di suit cha. As ushabad boot cha. All school siab siab de Asian Utigui to Bootha Chef Alti Stiala Uthali Uthali Sia Uquafa Togolcha Uquafa Togolcha. And that says to all of you, dear people, we give thanks, we thank, we thank you. It is good that we could be here together today. We pray and humble ourselves before our creator. We give thanks that you are all here with us. We help each other. We help each other in this way. We strengthen one another. Aren't those powerful words? Mm -hmm. Seven short lines that says we're better together. <laughs> right? So for though uh, I'd like to acknowledge, I'm not really sure Jay brought up whether you're on the land of the Snohomish or the Tulalip people, and I would encourage you to reach out to both of those 
uh, tribes, I would start with the Tulalip and uh, meet some of the people from that community and introduce yourselves as neighbors. I know on the Tulalip Reservation, there is Catholic, Pentecostal, 1910 Indian Shaker Church and the traditional smokehouse. I'm sure there are others, but those are the ones I'm familiar with and get to know your neighbors. Much of our cultures and traditions are shared with the Tulalip people, including our language. Uh, they speak La Southern Lashootse, we speak Northern Lashootse, which means about 95% of our language is the same. But we share so much of our culture together. So I hope that you reach out and uh, start to meet some of your neighbors and in invite them in or, or ask to be invited in so you could get to know them a little better. So like I said, I'm up for Skagit. And since none of my family's here, I'll tell you, we're from the mouth of the Skagit River in Mount Vernon, clear up to the New Halen Dam. And if you've ever crossed the North Cascade, you've gone through the most beautiful country in the whole world. Yes, yes, yes. that 1.5 million acres was our home and one of the richest lands in the world. And you could imagine if you anybody ever fished on the Skagit or camped up there, it is rich with wildlife, rich with salmon, rich with everything we need. So uh, I wear my cedar hat today because the cedars up there, are one of the most important things we have. We use it for our hats, our clothes, our baskets, our canoes, our houses. It's the center of our world. There was nothing that we didn't have. It was a rich culture. But in the mid 1800s, when the treaty was signed, the upper Skagit people were no longer recognized. We were, we didn't exist anymore. We were Skagit people without any identity. And so that 1.5 million acres was not attached to us. It took till the seventies before a group of our elders worked very hard to get our land recognition and get us paid for that land. At the time that we were paid for the land in the mid 70s, I had a couple of very small children. Uh, there were about 500 tribal members. We were just recognized. So I graduated from high school and we were just recognized as people. So I grew up being upper Skagit, but I was technically not recognized as a native person. And each of those 500 people or people who had ancestry to Skagit got about $400 for the land, that, that, that land. Um, part of the problem with that when we were no longer recognized and didn't have a land base is that our Skagit people, some stayed upriver, some stayed in Cedar Woolley and a few stayed in Mount Vernon, but most of our people were relocated to cities where they could find jobs. They were in Puyallup and Seattle and other reservations. And if you could imagine if all of a sudden I took your community and spread you all over, you would lose contact with each other. You would lose relationship. Your families might not marry each other and, and the culture breaks down. So uh, in 1975, when we were recognized again, Right after that, I had the fortune of starting to work from the tribe. I just graduated from high school and we had this little tiny office. I mean, it was a little tiny part of a house, but I got to start watching our people come home. And, and the first thing that we do, and I didn't do properly, is introduce myself. So I'll apologize. Squaha Sitsta, Skajit Chud, Yakima, Snoqualmie. Uh, from the Martin Moses Jones Washington family. So the very first thing we have to do is know who our family is. And as we came back, people are getting to meet their families for the first time. And in fact, I'm still teaching young people. They'll say something, I'll say, you're my relation. We're related to the Moses family. They don't know because they're now still coming back. So, so it is breaking up our community was uh, broke up our culture and our traditions. So, uh, so they're coming back, but I'm gonna go back a little bit because what I talk about is what broke up our traditions more, uh, which is the boarding schools. And my grandmother and her sister uh, went to Tulela boarding school and they didn't speak English. They went from speaking Lashutsi and like most children in our culture, they were with their grandparents almost all the time. Grandparents here, spend a lot of time with your grandkids. 
if if you know anything, your grandkids are your heart. They are your very soul. And if you could imagine you spend a lot of time with them, you're your teachers, you're probably more patient at this time of your life. And your grandchildren now go from your love and guidance to a boarding school. And they're not allowed to speak their language. They're only allowed to speak English. And they're not allowed to wear traditional clothes or eat traditional food. Their hair is cut off and everything about them has changed to enculturate. And it's really quite a shock. Um, and then they go from Tulalip to Chamawa. Does anybody know where Chamawa is? Chamawa is in Salem, Oregon. So now these children are moved from uh, Tulalip to Chamawa. And there are kids from Montana, California, Alaska, and there's a lot of intertribal mix. And now they're not allowed to speak their language. And they have a very rigid school. The girls half day do domestic, the boys half day do trade stuff, and then they are educated. And their whole mission is to enculturate these kids. And if you talk to people about boarding schools, you might get a hundred different people with a hundred different experiences of what boarding school was like, whether they were in a religious boarding school or someplace like Chamawa or Tulalip, they may not share really violent or bad experiences, and some may share really horrific experiences. But what they did is they came in and the first thing they did was cut off the girls' hair. If you see, I, I, I don't wear my hair cut in honor of my mother. Um, it's not all that stylish, but in, in honor of what, um, what they had to go through, it reminds me every day what they had to go through. So they go to school and they, kind of buy into this. I mean, my mom was a good student. She was salutatorian of her class. Um, and most of the kids were diligent in following the education. They went out and got good jobs. My uncle was a painter and my aunt was a nurse and they did these things, but they were enculturated. They learned to put everything about their traditional culture aside. And by the second generation, when my mom came, they didn't teach her Lashutsi. They didn't speak in front of her the language. And that generation below knew not that they would not learn the traditions, cultures, and teachings of the Skagit people because it was not going to benefit them or it might not even be safe for them to do that. If you're caught speaking the language in the boarding schools, you get your mouth washed out with lye soap, you'd be punished. Nothing about culture was accepted. And then one of my elders told me they used to sneak down in the basement, the kids together and talk together in their language. They, that's how they would sneak. The other thing that I was told at the boarding school, if you could imagine your grandchildren doing this, the children were often, um, tuberculosis and pneumonia were really common in the boarding schools. We lost a lot of our children in the boarding school. One of our families said he lost half of his children in the boarding schools. And, um, and the kids actually helped take care of each other. So they were de facto nurses. If you could imagine enroll, you know, using your students as helping. So this was just normal for her that she would help take care of uh, another student with tuberculosis or, or pneumonia. My, my aunt actually got tuberculosis and lived with that the rest of her life. Her daughter actually died from tuberculosis at 21. It was, it was, it was really common. So they went to boarding school. My mom talked about boarding school her whole life. My, my aunt, um, my grandmother was murdered when my mom was young. So my aunt was our de facto grandmother and she didn't talk about boarding school, <coughs> but, and neither did my mom. But when she did talk about it, she spoke about it in a more affectionate, fun way. Some of the fun things they did. Uh, and so we even stopped the, by the Chamao boarding school. We were going on vacation one time and she talked to some of the people that she knew at the school. So I didn't have a negative view of her experience at boarding school uh, until she was about 40 or yeah, about 40. And she started being really angry. And I, I was confused about why she was so angry about this, right? Why the change in her perception about this boarding school? And then she passed away and I found her 
keepsake book. And her keepsake, I open it up and the first thing I see is a program. You know how you have a school play, the programs? Well, once a year they got to have Indian Day and they got to pretend to be whatever Indian they were. Twice a year they could get letters from their parents on Christmas and their birthday. Twice a year they could get letters. And then I saw their schedules from morning to night, what they did. And I realized that she woke up to the lie that they were telling her that as a Indian woman, that she wasn't good enough. Her family wasn't good enough. What they ate wasn't good enough. How they prayed wasn't good enough. And it's like the light went on and they told her, we had to fix you. We have to enculturate you in a different way. And it was that little memory box of seeing what her life was like in boarding school and waking up one day and realized they had lied to her. They had lied to her every day about who she was as a native woman. My mom ended up becoming an incredible political activist uh, in her 40s. She went back to college, got a degree in political science, and became a political activist, speaking not only for native people, but anybody that didn't have a voice because she understood what it was like not to have a voice. And so um, the, the left, what remains of generations being taken from their family, uh, I will tell you one more story about the boarding school. We had a, an elder lady, I always ask my elders, did you go to boarding school? And this lady said, no, I didn't go to boarding school. She was the youngest of about 14 children. And by the time the government man is what they called him, came to get her, the older children were young adults and they stood in front of her and said, not this one. Mm. <laughs> I left for two days and cried. Mm -hmm. So we interview her again and I, then I find out her dad is a Shaker minister. He's a well-respected man. He's well-respected in his community. And the government man came to get her. And dad was both negotiating and pleading for him not to take his last child. Can I just raise this one child? I've lost half my children to tuberculosis and pneumonia in the boarding school. And he was pleading, can I just raise this one child? Do you imagine especially the men not having the power to protect your children, your women, your babies. And this man of great dignity, I understand we have a few ministers here. You're, you're well regarded in your community, but you didn't have enough power to, to protect your children. It's, it, it, is, it is degrading in the greatest sense of the word. He was able to keep that child home. And then he raised two grandsons and he was able to keep them home. But the cost to them was, that he wouldn't teach them the language. He made sure that they were very enculturated to be safe so that the government man wouldn't come and take them away. There's a cost for that when you lose your cultural identity. There's a cost for generations to come that we're still paying for. Uh, and, and you can see this breaking down when you lose your identity, all of a sudden I tell you, you can't be who you are. You can't be a Lutheran. You can't be part of your community. All of a sudden you don't know who you are. You're bad. And the cost goes for generations. So our answer today, at least the way I see the answer today, is to give back to our young people. We have many tribes that are doing cultural programs, bringing back our stories, our songs, our language, uh, the canoe journey, that we have to give back those things that were taken from my mother and my grandmother and to the ancestors so that we can help to start the heal what was taken from them and know that there's great pride in who we are. My great aunt always said, you come from a Siab family. Siab means honorable. And honorable in our way means that you carry yourself in an honorable way. You take care of your family, you, do, you, you go by your culture, you carry yourself in a high way. And when you know, we, when we can help our children understand that that's where they come from, then, then we can start healing this message of that you're not good enough, that something's wrong with you by what you do. And I think that you will see that in many, many of the tribes across the country, but certainly in the Northwest of taking ownership and pride in who we are and reclaiming um, what was taken from generations behind us. Ms. Rowan. That was beautiful.
And I always enjoy my sister sharing uh, her stories and she has a maternal sensitivity I don't have. Uh, my name is Jay Bowen. My native name is Clockadub. I'm Upper Skagit and about five or six other tribes. But I'm gonna tell you a story today. You wonder why we're here as cultural representatives. But first of all, I have to recognize that we have all these beautiful people here. And I noticed that with few exceptions, they're all women. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we, we come from our... I agree with that. <laughs> smart man. We, we have a matriarchal society. Uh, which is something very foreign to the Western world. Uh, and I look out at the Western world and I just shake my head. I think, what are you doing? You, you just, you're missing out. What are you doing? So the women in the tribe do the majority of make the majority of the decisions, have a powerful persuasion um, and very well respected. Most of our council is, is women. And people from the outside, they say, oh, all these women on the council. So, well, what, what do you mean? Well, that's, that's a council person. We don't see men, women. We see people doing their roles, answering their, answering their calling. Mm -hmm. so I can tell you a story that uh, gifted to me and my sister of the first non-native to show up in Skagit Valley. Come on in, come on in. And so uh, there was an event going on our grandfather and our family, let's see our family, yes. We were the holy people of the tribe. We were the medicine men and medicine women of the tribe. Our family has held a great high esteem. So my grandfather was in charge of the ceremony and all the singers were around the outside, the man standing in a big circle. My grandfather was in the middle, he had a big staff with him. And it was into the evening and into the camp, into the firelight came two young men. And they were dressed differently, light skin. The first non skagit to visit the area, the first one. And they walked in on a really important ceremony. What would you do? Right now, a flying thoughts had landed and some <laughs> folks got out and came. How would this group react to them? How would you react to them? How would my grandfather react to them? He sat them in a place of honor mm -hmm. and proceeded with the ceremony. He took his staff and he put it in the ground and he motioned for the two young men to come up one at a time and, and try to remove the staff. And they could not budge the staff. They couldn't budge it. And after they both sat down, he reached over and he took the staff. Then he put the staff back in the ground and he pushed it like this and went flying back and forth, not stopping. These are true stories, by the way. If you believe the Bible, you have to believe my stories. <laughs> okay. You know, it's training to be a, a minister. Interesting. Native minister, that's crazy. <laughs> we have the same stories. And I'm going to give the group here a book today um, of the stories, Native stories. Um, you call them a Bible. You put it together and call it a Bible. And... Uh, when it's published by the Anglos, it's called Legends. It's the same thing. <laughs> the same stories in here are in the Bible. No one has, you don't have an exclusive right to those stories. Jesus didn't make himself known only to one select group of people. He made sure the whole world was covered. These stories reaffirm that. So the, came, the staff was going back and forth and he motioned the young men up to get it. 
and both men, and they were a fit young man. They had just traveled across the country and hiked up the river and then, you know, God knows what, they, they had to be very fit. How would we look when we were 23 years old and you know, been hiking for, you know, months on end, we'd be fucked. <laughs> <laughs> well, each one of the young men got thrown to the ground. And then my grandfather reached and thought, put it down and put it down. What was he saying? You just witnessed what, what was shared to our family. What was he saying to those young men? You're going to be held accountable for this for the rest of your life, the message. My grandfather was saying, this is who we are. This is what we're about. Science, physics, medicine, protocol. Just the beginning. And these young men didn't understand their role they were playing. Just like today, you walk in, and what am I doing here? I'm going to hang out with the people talk. You, didn't, you fell into a role of responsibility. I'm hearing a story that's very, very important. And you can be held accountable for that story. And well, who they, what they should have done, they should have sent upriver the engineers, the scientists, the physicians, the philosophers, the astronomers, and talk to my grandfather, our grandfather. Our world would not be recognizable today. My grandfather did medicine that Western medicine is still trying to catch up to today. Western medicine doesn't have everything right. They, they are learning and they're adding wonderful things to it. You know? And it's a really strong, strong uh, school of education and practice. And I just appreciate that. It's one of God's gifts. But they ignored the gifts that were given to my grandfather, my great grand aunt. And I spoke at Wazoo two weeks ago about this. Who in here has cured pancreatic cancer? Whole group of physicians. Three times as many as here right now, four times as many. Nobody. Nerve damage, nobody. On and on and on. And they don't know how to reintroduce this information to their, their cultures. We have a lot of gifts to share with our community, with, with our new community. You're our new community. Uh, this, this world we live in today has seen people come and go through the, through the eons. The Dene people came right through here, right? Literally right through here, right down the way there, on the way from the Alaska to the Four Corners. Mm -hmm. We have visitors from all over the South Pacific, mm -hmm. Polynesia, China, when they brought here the skills of navigation, reading the stars, sailboats, the sails, outriggers. There's been friendly exchanges of information through the eons. The one thing that I know that I've learned from the Western culture is the ability to excuse yourself from responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's not mine. I've got my grandparents. I have nothing to do with that. But I stand in front of you. How am I introduced? I press gadget, tell her. You're going to hold every one of the Indian people you see to the standard I present to you. <laughs> if I fail, all Indians are bad. You know, if I say something wrong, you guys allow the speaker. Mm -hmm. You can say something individually wrong. Huh. That's that one, that's that one, that one, that's that one. Mm -hmm. no. We speak for our people. You hold us accountable to our people. In return, we can do the same for you. So the stories you hear today, there's a responsibility in hearing the story. Is sharing that story. 
Terry asked me, uh, I, I refer to Terry to my friends. How do I, how do I introduce Terry? Uh, I introduced him in our culture. Terry's a holy man. There's two of the most highest places you can reach in our culture is a holy man and a healer. They're par with each other. I've learned how to speak English. And native speak English very different, very, very different than uh, on the outside. And there's a lot of problems about that. And business and government and education. Um, we, people have said, well, don't you feel bad you lost your language? I said, oh, I didn't, I didn't lose my language. I stole yours. <laughs> <laughs> And the truth is, I'm better at it. <laughs> I'm better at it. I said, yeah. We enjoy inflection. My sister. My family. So when, when you say my family, what does that mean? I refer to my family going back to the last 500 years at my immediate family. When I went to Eastern Washington a couple weeks ago, spoke, spoke at Wazoo, two elder women come to me, they're my family. 150, 200 years have passed since that connection. When I hugged those women, I held my family. Hmm. Hmm. We don't respect distances. We're into subtleties. The nuances of our language. So when I speak to this group, I have to speak in terms I feel you can understand. When I speak to a native group, it's a whole different story. But I just, I've had to learn your language, your rules. I was told at a very young age, oh God, another day. God. So we're told as kids that the grandmas will look at, you just did it, you your granddaughter. They'll say, they'll look at you and look at you and look at you and look at you and say, I want you to be this. I want you to look at this. They look at your gifts. Grandpa Boom says, you know, a little guy put his hand on my shoulder and says, you know, I want you to go out and learn their language, learn their laws, learn their rules, learn their customs, and come back and help our people. He didn't say get locked in it, come back. I fight very, very hard for my culture. I fight very hard to respect your culture. And we expect the same in return. And now we are forced into a relationship where we are in like in this room, one family. Our culture has been very good about embracing the new people. My grandfather called them the new people. Rich, nice choice of words, description. So one way you can describe another culture without being derogative. There's no way to make the new people derogative. And believe me, Kay and I have heard every derogative term mm -hmm. for Native Americans. Everyone, by children and adults, in public and in private. We should be very bitter. Kay and I lost an inheritance worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions. That wasn't a long time ago. We were recognized in 1968. My enrollment number is 60. I'm supposed to be a multi, 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 multi millionaire. And it was taken. So why am I not destroying everything I see? So last year, I wanted to start a talk show. So I started a talk show on, on Facebook and we're gonna do, work into something else, but I had to get permission from the grandma. Can I do this? Can I talk about our culture? Can I talk about our people, our traditions? And the one grandma put it the best. She said, yes, 
They need our help. Go save them. They need our help. You can share our stories. Five years ago, the answer would have been no. We were never allowed to talk like this about our people, our, our culture in public, ever. Our business, our family. But the elders have said, yes, go help them. Tell them the story that will help them survive. Keep them from destroying themselves. Show them the medicine. We know we have no word for God. We have no word for death. We have no word for goodbye. The creator. Going home. Until I see you again. Mm -hmm. I love our language. Mm -hmm. Things I can teach you. When you say goodbye, do you mean goodbye? What do you really mean until I see you again? Do you mean until I see you again? Native people don't die. We go home. We recognize our true home is in heaven. We're visiting here. I always find it funny that in the Western world, People try to put God in a box, you know, the box. And the, the, the natives reluctantly, love reluctantly through the years have built boxes you know, put put God in, you know. <clears throat> that we're taught when you wake up in the morning, God's there. The angels are there. The spirit helpers are there. Your work is there. What's called our work? Okay, and I do my work today. It's called our work. What you're doing here, listening to me, is your work mm -hmm. of responsibility, accountability to the church and your family. The most important work in the world. There's nothing more important that we're, we're all experiencing together now. And I can tell you who the most important people in the world are. most important people in the world. You've been given a responsibility to charge them to represent your culture. With all the same pride, the K and I represent our culture. So if you want to reach out to the native cultures, say, here's who we are. This is our culture. This is my family. This is my people. We'd like to invite you to dinner. This is what we, this is what we eat. Come join us. Represent your family. Hold yourselves accountable to the same things you're holding me accountable for, okay, accountable for. I hold Terry to a very high standard. I don't, I don't excuse him as being any one particular minister. The holy man. He represents the creator. What a great calling. But I want to thank you again for inviting me here. I'm going to leave this. Uh, to the church, you know, they put it in the library. Yeah, they're very hard to come by. They, I, I ordered these to uh, everywhere I could online, trying to find bits and pieces of them here, there, and about. Um, but inside this, you'll find the story of the Great Flood, Jesus Christ, Tower of Babel, all the same. <laughs> so, does anybody have any questions? That they do. We have time for a couple yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, I want to thank Kay and Jay very much for their sharing, and we want to open it up for questions both here and online, and we encourage you to use the chat feature if you have uh, those of you that are streaming in this morning. Uh, again, a uh, special welcome to the folks at Shepherd of the Valley and Maple Valley. We're glad that you're with us as well. Uh, and also, I'm going to have my wife pass around a sheet. Uh, some of you, okay, it's been going around. Anybody that uh, is not on our email list and would like to receive the weekly emails that have a lot of resources, both print resources as well as links to videos. Uh, if you want to dive deeper into the subject, uh, I'm happy to share those resources with you. Just make sure that you're on the email list and I'm happy to uh, make sure you receive that information. 
So, Rick, is that question was the title of the book? The title of the book, Indian Legends of the Pacific Northwest by Ella Clark. So you can email that to us. I'd also like to encourage, has anybody here been to the Heebold Center on the Tulalip Reservation? If you haven't been there, go. It's a beautiful place, has a long house, has the Point Elliott Treaty, has a section on the boarding school. Uh, I think that, you know, that's a great place to start. But I really encourage you to reach out to your tribal neighbors. Um, you know, Terry might have some suggestions. Pastor Rick might uh, know some people. Once you start building those connections, doors open and build relationships. Jay talked about sharing your culture. And I, I think there is nothing better than the words that I said that we're better. We strengthen each other when we're together. So knowing each other and sharing each other that way is the best thing we can do for each other, especially in these really difficult times mm -hmm. where we tend to pull within ourselves and, and we've lost trust. We only keep in our safe circle. And we find out great stories about great people. And, you know, I, I, I imagine if I visited with you, that's exactly what I would hear as well. So the Hebulb Center would be a great place to start if you haven't been there. No, it's a wonderful cultural center. Um, Beth and I have been there before, if you haven't had a chance. Uh, they are so welcoming and there's a lot of wonderful information. Um, so please uh, take advantage of that. Any, uh, any other notes in the chat? Questions here? Um, please, Beth. Jay, you mentioned that the grandmothers gave you permission to share the yeah. stories. Yes. And that five years ago, that would not have happened. Family yes. business, private. And they've agreed that they recognize the world is in jeopardy right now. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we read the paper. Yes. The environment's collapsing. Social, un social unrest everywhere. We got wars, people dying. No one's upset about it. There's also a fear of people taking our culture and using it in a way that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so it's very much, much guarded um, that it was appropriated. And so uh, being very careful, some things we can speak of, some things we can't, uh, but our culture we can. And yeah. Jay spoke about the matriarchal, you ladies would be held in the highest regard for your wisdom and experience. And uh, yeah. It does not. It women, does yeah. not mean you have more power than the men, but it does mean that you you are held in a different regard than we see in dominant society. So, yay for the women. Does that fall through most of the tribes in the in the Northwest? It isn't yeah. through all the tribes throughout the United States, but certainly in the Northwest, um, we're yeah. matriarchal. So we're getting ready for a naming That's ceremony in our family. And it is the eldest woman in the family that assigns the names, not the eldest man. So that's part of the matriarchal. There are things that the women do. The men have their own roles that are really important and held in high regard. There's definitely different roles, but um, it is the equality of our men and women that, that really, I think, is such a great example for the world. There's a... Does everyone know that the United States Constitution came from the Air Force? Common knowledge. So a group from uh, Philadelphia took off to go hang out with uh, the uh, Air Force. And uh, they want to observe their form of government. Franklin and all the rest of the crew is all there. And they took notes. And they adopted the Iroquois way of life as a constitution for the United States of America. They changed a couple things up. The Iroquois were maternal, patriarchal. And that translated, they scratched that right out. <laughs> <laughs> women, women made primary decisions, you know. They truly treated everyone as equal. I can share a story about that. I was very young. I was working for the tribe and this elderly couple came into the tribal office. They're no bigger than this. They're tiny little people. And at the time we had only been recognized for a couple of years. So they come in and they sit down there in front of my desk and, and the BIA came 
And the BIA came to offer them a new home because they had determined that they were in a substandard home, right? So I listened to this presentation by the BIA and they're proud. They're proud that they're offering this elderly couple this home. So they're talking only to the gentleman, the elder gentleman, and, and they're, all, and he, they're all excited. And, and they finish their presentation. And he leans over to his wife and he says something and she responds and he looks back and says, no, thank you. It was clear to me that while they only spoke to him and they recognized him as the authority in this couple, that he turned to her and she had the complete power of that answer. It was one of the most powerful things that I saw as a young woman and that, that relationship of a very elderly couple that in a few short words, it was clear that, that he gave her all of that authority even though it looked like he had that power. So today we've all lived out my grandfather's story that shared with us. And I'm very shocked that there's not more questions. You could ask us questions about science, religion, Jesus. Why are you not asking those questions? I really like to know why. Did we have Jesus? We have the Holy Spirit? We have a creation story? We have science? We have medicine? We have engineers, astronomers, astrologers, astronomers. Every tribe yeah. has creation story. Yes. You it's, it's hard, big it's hard for there. us to understand. Uh, you have a creation story about the turtle in one tribe that I read about. Oh, but turtle that's, Island. That, well, yeah. no, I think he's talking Southwest, yeah. probably. Yeah. 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 Minnesota. And, and, yeah. and so, how do we? relate what our background is to that and then you go over to another tribe and they have a different story and a different tribe and a different tribe and and you mean like they, europe well <laughs> right here we live someday. Yeah. or the middle east right yeah. 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 it's worldwide but, but you can accept it from them how, 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 how do we escape from not escape from but adjust with our background and our traditions to the many different traditions all over. The best way to find out that, that it is the same. I'll answer your question. Find out your own creation story, what your family has taught, what your culture teaches, and share them when you hear a creation story. You share them, and one by one, you begin making bridges. This is our creation story, and they'll tell you theirs. This is ours, they'll tell you theirs. I can tell you how it happened in reverse. My great grandfather uh, was a traditional man and he was an interpreter for a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. And he was, he didn't go to religious boarding school, anything like that, but he was an interpreter. And at the time transitioning into Christian religion was safer than, because uh, our religion was outlawed. And he determined at the time he chose to convert to Catholicism. And the reason that he said he converted to Catholicism is that he could find parallels between our teachings and the Catholic teachings. So you look for those parallels. It may not be the same words that you would read, but you can see the parallels in the stories. So we do cross-cultural communication. Uh, we're gonna talk to you in ways that are different than, than, you, than we might talk to each other. So you look for similarities in those stories. What does that mean? And in our stories, we don't tell you what they mean. It was the most frustrating thing for me when I became a young adult and our elders started telling me stories and I was raised in a traditional education system. And she said, so what does that mean? And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm a straight A student. You're supposed to just tell me the answers. <laughs> tell me how to understand that. We don't do that. You have to kind of interpret and figure that out on your own. What do you see and what do you hear? And if it requires that you put it down and come back and look at your stories and, and that, then you just do that till you come to some sense of, I think I understand. You may not. You may hear our Skagit story and say, I understand. That's very similar to ours. We have a story called Lifting the Sky. And in the beginning, the spirit world was too low. And there's a whole story about lifting the sky. And I think that if, if you got that, there's all sorts of stories behind it. So I think um, that you look at each of those creation stories and see 
like my grandfather did, how do you find similarity? How do you find similarities? And, and it may be as different as saying Muslims and uh, Judaism or you know, Pentecostals, they don't understand there's different theologies. It may be that kind of difference, but you do look for the similarities. In yeah. other words, said, yeah. the humanness of all people. You're uh, a very wise man. <laughs> it, it interferes with God's creation and, yeah. and what we should be together. Our people understood when, when the new people came, they weren't a really big surprise to my grandfather. They weren't a surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very different relationship with the spirit world. We understand the spirit travel the world, develop relationships all around the world with all sorts of people. We knew the world was around 40,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. When the reason North America is referred to a turtle <laughs> island, because if you look at it from the stage, it looks like a turtle. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks like a giant turtle. How do we know that? We had an awareness of the whole world, all the cultures on it, you know, and also a perspective of the earth that no one can uh, stop to ask. Or in the way we say creator is ha ha shaksia. Ha ha shaksia. Ha ha means holy, and shak means above, and siab means honorable one. So like most of the words we had to translate uh, into what English people would understand. So ha ha shaksia means creator. And we can also use that for God. Um, so that's the word we use. But I, I would really encourage you to, to look at different creation stories and see what similarities you can find. Um, because we all have a creator. We all believe in God. And, and the one things that we have is if you look at, Christian values. We hold the highest regard for our, our elders. We believe like Christian people that each of us have a calling. The creator calls us to do particular work. We are, and it's our job to figure that out. So I could understand why my grandfather did not have that conflict in Christian teachings because God calls us to find what our, what our gift is to the world and bring it to us. So those aren't in conflict. I would encourage you just to keep keep looking and, and trying to look through different eyes and put it away and look again. But learn your own story. Yeah, learn your own story. How, how do we learn your story? Until five years ago, it wouldn't be welcome, evidently, for you to share it. I just gave, you, that, you, that that I gave you a book. You can read it. Well, and, and, what I'm saying yeah. is, is the common person within your tribe. Right. And how do we communicate? And a lot of common people here. And a lot of people aren't going to come out and just speak. Uh, Terry, we happen to meet Terry, and God bless him. We we become good friends. And Jay and I do this work so we can help build relationships in the community. And we hope that you'll continue to build those relationships. That's how you'll hear the stories. There is a, also a lot of books by Vi Hilbert, so please write that down. And she has taken the time to go and interview ancestors who are no longer here that have all our stories. And they have the story of the first contact at Tulalip. I mean, so look for Vi Hilbert's books. I'm write her name. Yeah. And uh, you will so much learn so much about not only the Skagit people, but she worked with tribal people all up and down the Northwest. She was responsible for working with a linguist that made our, our Lashutsi dictionary. She endlessly gave the rest of her adult life to going and recording elders that were first speakers uh, in the language and recording their stories. And so find her books and you can also find her stories on a CD. So I have a couple of her stories on CD. I have some of my favorites. One's called um, Rock and Coyote, which I always share with fourth graders, which is just a hilarious story. Uh, but everybody has their favorite story. So you could get, get them on CD, read the books. And I think that you, our stories are an inward look at who we are. It's our values, right? So, you, so if you want to know the Native people, the Skagit people, the, the Coast people, we're the river people. We're not really Coast Natives. We're the river people. Then the great way to do it is look at those stories. And the loss of our language, the reason that that's so important is in our language, whether you speak English or Ukrainian or Skagit, 
there are words that are unique. They show you the most important. Like we have many, many words for water. Mm -hmm. And because there's different, so so when you lose the language, you lose the ability to to be more descriptive that way. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to, if you want to know more about the stories, look up by Hilbert's by Hilbert's books. We had a couple of comments from the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, what I hear, what I hear in these stories and understanding is that God approaches us with, in our cultures with varied stories, but the essence of all of them is that God comes. To us in love and, and yearns for us to live in harmony with God, one another in creation. And uh, comment: uh, we see we see signs and names of places written in native language, but we don't know how, how to read, pronounce those names due to how it's written. How can you understand your culture names? We'd be happy to honor the place uh, place names, but can't read them. Well, <laughs> there's there's a couple things. You can go on the Tulalip language website mm -hmm. and uh, you uh, they actually tell you how to say those letters and vowels. Um, if you really if you really have questions and you say, tell me this, we'll be happy to, to see if we can get back to you and, and tell you what you're saying. Um, because yes, they're not easy. Imagine this. Uh, I didn't grow up speaking the shoot seed so you can imagine there's also a block built in for us that it that that not to speak our language it was really hard for me to overcome to even begin in our language uh so you can imagine what this looked like us and if it's okay may i close in a prayer uh in the language would that be all right okay um I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer for you in our language so that you can hear it in a, in a more fluent way. I wish that I could speak fluently, but I can pray fluently. So. <laughs> To each as a chuff, I'll quit box the hail, as I'll be to booth, I'll taste the hail. Hold chuff, who will eat to booth at a squatter chuff. Hold the leap, I'll take tubby at the squatter solid, but I'll just with a lala to booth, talk us back the quarter chuff, which a little to boot to our quick back, sir. Oh, my sister, talk we start to body to be our eighty cent display. Amen. So if you think that you may have a little hard time interpreting, it took me, I couldn't even tell you how long it took me to, to learn just some of our prayers. And uh, it's, it's some hard work. Our young people are, are becoming very fluent again. And mm -hmm. I don't know that in Skagit we have any more first speakers. So it's even more difficult. But Vi has recorded all those people. Uh, there's language classes. And if you think you could do that, I'd be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> happy to happy to help you out. Let's again thank K and J for being with us today. We're very very grateful. I uh, just wanted to remind you of our upcoming sessions. We have next week uh, an interesting film on the Indian boarding schools. Uh, K shared a little bit with us. Uh, we're going to talk about that about the the tragedy and the traumatic legacy of the native boarding schools. And then on May 15th, we have our special guests, uh, former Bishop Jessica Christ and Marlene Rabbit Helgamo. They're part of the ELCA task force, Native American task force on um, repudiating the doctrine of discovery. And they're going to be uh, with us for that last session, talking about what Lutherans are doing to offer healing and hope and to bring uh, Native American people and our um, larger culture together in greater understanding uh, and appreciation for one another. I wanted to mention um, the public declaration that I sent out the first uh, couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's a public declaration that was made in 1987 to the tribal councils and traditional spiritual leaders of the Indian and Eskimo peoples of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's a very uh, important document. If you uh, didn't see that and would like a copy, uh, let me know. Uh, it was signed by the, the uh, main religious leaders 
of various uh, denominations and religious persuasions at the time. Um, and at the, uh, let me just uh, read a part of, part of it. Uh, this is a formal apology on behalf of our churches for the longstanding participation in the destruction of traditional Native American spiritual practices. We call upon our people for recognition of and respect for your traditional ways of life and protection of your sacred places and ceremonial objects. And it goes on to say, we ask your forgiveness and blessing. Um, and then it says, may the promises of this day go forward on public record with all of our congregations and communions uh, and our commitment to the native peoples of the Pacific Northwest. And may the God of Abraham and Sarah and the spirit who lives both in the cedar and salmon people be honored and celebrated. Uh, this was in 1987. And I suspect that many of us never heard of it, uh, but it's an important document that should be lifted up. So Jay and I would like to thank you for inviting us to your home and sharing and being open with us. We really appreciate you and your faith. Thank you. And I want you all to know that, that Jay and Kay will be joining us, and, and Andrea will be joining us at the Burlington Lutheran today to offer a welcome to the land uh, to the installation of Pastor Cheris Weathers at Burlington Lutheran. Very nice. That's why we didn't come and worship with you this morning, because it was just too much. A long day. It'll be a long day. We're just human beings here. Pastor Rick, if we could have a moment to take a picture with you before. You bet, you bet. And just I just want to close with the, the folks that we have online. Again, our thanks to those of you who are joining us online, including our friends at Shepherd of the Valley Lutheran Church in Maple Valley. Good to have you with us. Uh, and all of you online, thank you for being part of today. We hope to uh, have you join us again next week. Also, uh, if you want to check out the Our Savior's YouTube channel, these sessions are being recorded and you can, uh, can check them out uh, or share them with your friends. Again, blessings to you for this uh, coming week and we hope to see you next Sunday. Blessings. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Did you get a song? I got it.